Uh, I'm a newcomer to men's sheds, um, and so uh, I'm finding out so much about, about this and looking forward to the rest of the day. Um, now, I'm very nervous. Um, I, I give hundreds of talks, I, you know, just, just hundreds, so many talks, all about statistics. And, and the thought of talking about something that isn't statistics fills me with fear and trepidation. So you've got to forgive me. I've never, ever spoken about the stuff I'm going to talk about in public. So this is the first time you are the test audience. Usually I test my material and use it, you know, refine it and tell the same jokes over and over and over again. You know, you just get, usually get the same stuff, but you're not going to get, unless you want to lecture on COVID statistics, I'd love to do that. It'd be so much easier, <laughs> but it's not what you came for. So I'm not going to do it. Just a bit of background. Um, I used to be a, a sort of academic statistician and do stuff like that. Well, I mean, you, you don't care about these things, but some people do, you know, all medical statistics, mathematics, stuff and I used to do that but I was very fortunate in 2007 that a, a nice billionaire always make friends with a billionaire they're great he's been given me given us trough loads of money for years now um, I, I gave me this opportunity to have this new job professor for the public understanding of risk and so that enabled me to get on television do the whole I was trying to be a sort of Brian Cox look-alike so, you know, it's no, shameless, absolutely shameless. You know, they're getting on the television, trying to make TV shows and, um, you know, get, doing news work, writing popular books, all this sort of stuff, um, which I did. And, and it actually worked quite well because there wasn't one. There wasn't a Brian Cox of statistics, so I could try to fill up that role. So I ended up writing books like this, Art of Statistics, Learning for Day, which sold very well. Nothing like a pandemic for selling stats books. No, always, no, there's always a bright side to everything. <laughs> And uh, Anthony and I wrote this COVID by numbers book as well, which has done very well. I was doing that at Hay Festival last week or so. Um, so that's been great. And, uh, but the main achievement for this was uh, over the last couple of years was doing a lot of media stuff. You may have heard me on the radio quite a lot on more or less and you know, today. And there's me on Andrew Marr having a rant about the government's press briefings. I didn't used to do many rants, but that got you know 1.7 million views for a little clip of me ranting on Andrew Marr. Anyway, that's by the way. The main achievement from all of this was getting on Desert Island Discs, <laughs> which I don't know about you, but it's been my utter life's ambition. Um, you know, I chose my records 15 years ago, just, you know, and since then I've sat there waiting. <laughs> And nothing happened. But because of this sort of coverage, I managed to get on Desert Island Discs. And when I was on Desert Island Discs, I talk about, I did have a conversation about men's issues. And, um, and that's when Charlie got hold of me afterwards and said, would you like to come to Men's Shed? So that's why I'm here, because I was on Desert Island Discs. And it was good. You know, it's, I, it, I won't talk about that now, but if anyone wants to talk afterwards about being on Desert Island Discs, um, it's an interesting experience. OK, let's go back to the 1980s which was uh, personally a very troubling time for me in mid-1980s. I split up with my wife um, amic fairly amicably, and we had a three-year-old daughter. That's, I think that's a bit later, that's 88, I think, 88, she was, uh, or even 89, she was about six then, I think, 88. Anyway, that's me and her. So um, I was essentially, we split up, and we arranged but between ourselves 50-50 care, no lawyers involved absolutely nothing, wouldn't do it. Um, so I, had, I was a sort of single parent for half the week and not a parent for the other half the week. And that was quite challenging. Um, and the other, but the other thing was that um, in the process of splitting up, we'd gone to marriage counselling and it was very good, not to keep us together, but just to, you know, really, that wasn't the aim. And I, it was the first time I had, uh, and then I went on my own to see the counsellor. And it was the first time I'd been in a situation where I could talk about, actually talk about my feelings. Um, in, to, to a, someone who was non-judgmental, who's doing all the, what I learned afterwards about the, the, you know, the uh, open questions and the feedback and the things like that. She was doing good listening. Um, and, uh, and this was a real surprise to me that there was this, you know, this could be done because this has not been part of my upbringing as a man uh, to be able to talk like this. I had friends, I had male friends, we had a lot of fun, and everything like that. But this a bit of business of just being able to talk about how you felt about things, I realized, God, I've, I've, you know, I'm 30 something, and um, what was I, 30, 33 or something like that? And this has just not been part of my life. I don't want to um, carry on like this, but I, I didn't know what to do about it. And then, there. There it is. I found it recently. I went through old files and found this old flyer which I've written on and things like that. 1986, this was stuck up in the window of the local health food shop. 
um, advertising a men's group. I didn't even know what a men's group was. 1986 this was. And um, so I actually dared pick up the phone, Steve, and phoned him and went along to this group. And it was, it was strange. You know, there's only five, five of them. Now, the first of all, the men's group had been formed, and this is very relevant to men's sheds, it was based, it, we were meeting in a general practice because it was, um, it was a local general practitioner who's interested in men's mental health. And the person who founded it, Willie, um, was, had gone along with anxiety and depression to his GP. So he was a, a man that went to his GP and, um, and had been recommended by this amazing this GP. It was extraordinary insight to, why don't we, to form groups. And they, he was, they were doing that based in the general practice. So this, we met in the general practice for this group. There were five, only three people this flyer atta- attracted, and there were five in the group. So there's just eight of us. And um, we, <laughs> And it was amazing. For a start, they ran a crash, which was interesting. And um, yeah, I hadn't expected, it was all men. Um, and uh, and, and we, we just, we talked about why we'd come, our feelings, and uh, what, what, how they talked about how this group ran, which I'll come on to in a moment. And then we did a, gui- a guided um, fantasy, which I didn't know. You lie on the floor, and Steve then took us through this sort of fantasy of walking along a desert island of the sand, feeling the sand on our feet. And it was lovely just lying there at that point. The local community constable walked in the door <laughs> in his full uniform because he had seen something, we just looking around at what was going on. Oh my God, he says. <laughs> Turns around and walks out again. So I thought, oh great, this is, this is just lovely. So we all fell about laughing. But um, it, was, it was great. And we all, the three of us who turned up, joined this group. And so the point is that we're still meeting 36 years later. Same men, apart from the two who have died and others have moved away, a few couple of new ones, very little very little churn in 36 years. We're still meeting up. Okay, so I just want to write, you know, I think this is quite unusual to many people. It was more common in the 1980s. But if you talk about the men's movement now, a lot of people I think will think of it as sort of men's rights, almost being anti-women. You know, men have got to stand up for themselves against the encroachment of women and things like that. This is the total opposite. This was uh, an anti-sexist, pro-feminist, movement that was very, really quite active in the 1980s, if many of you can remember that, I'm sure. There was this magazine called Achilles Heel. There were quite a network of men's groups. There were men's meetings, around the conferences around the country, and there was all that feeling going on. So it, it did feel that there was a kind of movement. And um, so, the, and the idea was quite explicitly to counter what well, can be referred to as toxic masculinity, essentially of uh, bottling up your feelings, of competitive banter as the sole way of communication between men, you know, discussing facts and opinions about cars and football and things like that, all that sort of archetypal male discourse, which of course, you know, while it, you know, it's, oh, not everyone's like that, that, that did reflect a lot of the male communications I knew about and still, and still can recognize. Um, so, um, so it was active to, to do that. The, the, the main, the, in terms of the organization, we just met every two weeks and carried on then for the next 35 years. Um, every th- two weeks in people's houses, um, up to eight members, varies. As I said, you know, p- some people come and go. Um, the, but very little churn. Um, uh, the, uh, no, there's leaderless, there's no leader. Everyone, it's a completely cooperative activity. And, I, I, it was interesting, you know, reading the men's sheds discussion about how uh, the shoulder to shoulder works very well for conversing rather than direct face to face conversation. We, we have done face to face most of the time. So, you know, round in a circle. And, but the crucial thing is, is listening. I, I find that it's the listening is more important than the speaking for me as well. It's been, that that um, is, has almost been the more challenging thing to learn. Um, because the listening is specifically, um, you know, non-judgmental. Um, uh, it, it's to do with exploring the other person's feelings and pulling them out. So it's all open. You know, it's really. Uh, it, it's sort of. I mean, a lot of this comes out from apparently this thing, co-counselling, which I haven't, um, you know, haven't been involved in, including this term news and goods which is when at the start of the meeting, everyone sits around and the first half, the first hour or so, people, well, people would get about five, five, 10 minutes each, just to talk about where they were. 
and it was reflecting on your feelings about your current life, particularly your family, um, your children, your work maybe, activities and so on. But it was your feelings about it. It wasn't your opinions about what was going on in the world. We didn't discuss anything about world issues, nothing about sport, nothing about cars, nothing about television, nothing about all the normal topics of conversation. It wasn't that they were banned, it's just that they, unless you, you could express how they make you felt, they just weren't interested. That was not what we were going to talk about. And so it, it, it allowed this sort of permission to do this. And the crucial thing about the listening is that you don't counter with a, you don't try to up the story. Oh, you think that's bad. You know, you should have seen when I did the blah, blah, blah. You know, that competitive conversation, which is so male, um, was just, it, it just didn't happen. That was just not what we are doing. You were trying to draw people out trying to explore their feelings. And then after tea, we'd, we would just, something would have come up. And we, we, over the years, we've tried absolutely everything to sort of fill up the time, you know, activities. We've taken photographs of each other. We've sang together. We've done all sorts of stuff. But it still comes down to that basic expression of where you are in an open way and being listened to, and then further exploring. And just, and just people, I mean, of course, as we got older, 35 years, we get older. Did you know that? Did you know you get old? And you start falling apart. I've had prostate cancer. We got, you know, we so we go through. God, I could make a tell all my. I used to tell all my stories about my catheters and things. So it was sort of. Um, it, we could make a laugh out of it. Actually, you could always make almost anything funny. Um, it was quite extraordinary. Um, so the, the supportive listening, essentially feelings, not opinion, confidential. I mean, that's one of the problems that I could tell you. Oh, I could tell you stories to make your hair curl, but um, I can't. Because we talk to each other about things that people did not speak to their partners about. So there's, uh, you know, it's, it's completely complex. The moment we've just written, uh, after Desert Island Disc, we got asked to write an article for The Guardian, which should come out. Two and a half thousand words on this. And it's a real problem because we <laughs> it's confidential. We cannot write about, you know, I can't say about what we talk about. And then they start saying, well, we want some specific examples of what, they, no, we cannot tell you, sorry. What don't you understand about confidential? <laughs> so we have to give vague allusions to things. It's really quite tricky. But for me anyway, it's been enormously valuable. Okay, so I'd just like to give some examples of how valuable this has been to me, how this is, you know, why I've uh, wanted to keep this going for essentially more than half my life. Um, that's my son, Dan, in 1992. Can you notice something about that photograph? No, the, it's not the red eye that's odd. It's the white eye that's odd. You remember red eye from flash photographs is very common. If you see that in the photograph, get your child or that child to the GP immediately. In fact, get them to a specialist eye thing. That's eye cancer. Um, and uh, in fact, it was, wasn't, that wasn't how uh, that was diagnosed. We, we recognized that afterwards. He's actually, he had a small squint and went along. So he had cancer of the eye, diagnosed at 11 months, which is a, a real shock, but it, just as a warning, retinoblastoma, that is. So um, it's not, not necessarily, it's not the only cause, but that is a really, really um, important sign. So, uh, so he went along and then uh, he went through everything, went to, oh God, he had radiotherapy, and he had chemotherapy, and then he had a stem cell transplant, and then he got better, and that was him at about at four, Four in the summer of four? Does he know when he was five? He was five then, I think. Anyway, that was in Portugal on holiday. Lovely boy, beautiful boy, and then he died. So, um, and we knew he was going to die, and so, you know, it was really difficult. Um, and I said, I've never spoken about this before. 25 years ago, he died, 1997. And, um, and, but we knew he was going to die. It's odd when you know your child is going to die. You get these bizarre conversations when you were trying to you know, choose where who's going to be buried. We, we wanted to be buried in the local cemetery, but it was full, we couldn't do it. So there's another cemetery. We didn't want him in the main town cemetery. So you spent ages doing all this planning. And then you, you know, I talked to the city council guy and said, oh, we think we'd like, you know, can you find us a place in Histon Road Cemetery, which they did. And he said, uh, for our son, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your son's passing. And we said, oh, he's, he's not dead. He's in the next room eating smoked salmon sandwiches and watching Lion King for the 53rd time. So, um, but we knew he was going to. Um, so that all went, um, we had to, uh, but the crucial thing, when he died, I had, um, actually before that, 
Yeah, we tried to plan it. And I got, do you know about the Natural Death Handbook, the Natural Death Movement? I, again, I really recommend the Natural Death website and the Natural Death Handbook. It, it's about taking control of funerals and someone's death, rather than just handing it over to the local um, uh, funeral directors, who actually were beautiful. They, they, they do kids for free in, in Cambridge. So they were lovely, but we still wanted to do as much as possible. So we did almost everything ourselves, including building the coffin. So the day after he died, we, oh, actually he was at home. Um, we had 100 people into the house. We laid him out. He died at home. And he laid him out. 100 people came to see him. So I'm getting a bit distracted away from the men's stuff, but um, including most of his class. All these five-year-old kids trooping in, come up to see Dan. They all sat around. It was quite extraordinary. It was really impressive. So, and uh, they still remember it. It was great. Um, anyway, so, oh, so um, so the next day, though, I uh, had to go to the, uh, you know, to get, and I, the, the, the book comes with a complete design for a coffin. Build your own coffin. So I built my own coffin. And I'm not a great, um, you know, carpenter or anything like that. But in our men's group, there were two trained carpenters. Whoa, what about that, eh? So this is out the back of my house. I mean, tell we went through the night. Uh, two days after Dan died, with three members of the group, um, there are others, building this coffin. And it was MDF. It's quite good, and you can build, because you want a coffin shape, you want to bend the MDF, and so it sh they show, the book shows very nicely how you do, you know, saw uh, just about a third of the way through on the curve, and it produces a very nice bend. So that's exactly the design from the Natural Death Handbook. It's really good to follow. You go, <laughs> you go along to the local, you know, some, you know some wood suppliers, oh, I'd like this MDF, and so well, hey, MDF, and I just hope it's going to be strong enough. And the guy said, well, what are you using it for? Well, I'm building my son's coffin. And he said, oh, yeah, it'll be all right for that. He said, <laughs> completely non-plus, you know, <laughs> didn't bat an eyelid from this. And anyway, we built this coffin. It was lovely. It, it just over that we did it, it took us about a day, a day and a bit. Um, and it was a really lovely thing to do. And then um, after we, we built the thing, and then uh, we had another committee that came in to decorate the outside and then make the inside. A whole bed is all beautiful, beautifully cushioned. And, and he was in there with his toys and all that kind of stuff. So it was a really, the whole community joined in, which was very powerful. And then um, we buried him. And to bury him, uh, we just <laughs> walked out the house and closed the street. We, actually, we didn't tell anybody we were going to do this. We just walked down the street um, with a, his uncle at the front playing Danny Boy and, you know, large, huge numbers of people behind. And we did the whole cer ceremony in the church hall down the road and uh, did it all ourselves as much as possible. So it's a really powerful thing. But, and my men were uh, taking the photographs, uh, was one of the men's group taking the video. They were just all around helping me through all of this and have been ever since. Um, so, uh, so this was a really important time. And the other thing that I, I realized the importance of the, men, the sort of training I'd had with the men's group was that after five years, after Dan died, I became a, 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 um, on the, worked on the Child Death Helpline, which works at from Great Ormond Street in Alderhay for anybody whose child has died. But all the volunteers on the end of the phone have had children who've died. You've got to have your own child, and you've got to be five years out, and you've got to go through lots of training. So that's quite a criterion. So anyone who picks up the phone gets the knows that the person in the end, at the other end of the phone, has had a child who died. So there's none of this. Oh well, you don't know what I think. Although we are absolutely told as part of the training, we must not talk about our own experience. That's not because you get asked, and you have to push it politely, push it away, and say, "Well, would you, I'd like to hear more about what happened to your child." And they say, "Could you tell me more about that?" Um, and we're not, it was very interesting training, but I realized, God, I've done, all, I've done this already. The non-directive, the non-judgmental, the, the reflecting back, the open questions, not the closed questions. Um, I've done all this. I've been doing this for years with my men. So it was actually, I didn't find the training difficult. And I actually found being on the end of the helpline okay. Um, what's the interesting thing, I don't know if people have worked in this context, is because you're not, but it's non-directive, again, which we'd experience, I'd experienced in the group. We're not supposed to try to solve people's problems. We're not trying to, you know, again, it's the real male thing. What you should do is, you know, you, you treat everything as a problem to solve. And then, you know, we're going to work out what we're going to do about it. No. 
This is just as reflective. This is allowing people to talk about the problems. It's not trying to solve them. In the end, we were allowed, you know, we were told we, you are allowed if you really, you know, if after going over and reflecting back and talking about, you can say, you can give some suggestion. And the way to do it, we learned, was to say, some people have found it helpful to X. And that, I learned that there's a really good way to put, rather than saying, I think you should do this, or this is the right thing to do, just to say, reflect back on other people's experience some people have found it helpful to do with something like that. And because it's, non, it's not saying you should do this, it's just a, a factual thing. So I think I found that a really useful tool in when you actually kind of do want to give a little bit of guidance, but you don't want to make it prescriptive. Okay, so I worked on that for five years or so, and that was a, a big experience. Um, I, I, I'm gonna finish soon um, and just uh, uh, have um, uh, some, um, uh, ask for questions. Uh, I don't know how I'm getting on for time. Um, that's my shed. You know, I, you know, but I, I tend to, I said we built, we, our, our men's group, we, we built a coffin. We did other things together, other projects. We built a, a, a bench for a member who's getting married. And we, we have, we've done other creative things together. Um, but, but I usually, I tend to work in my shed on my own. So that's my shed, which I really like, or a corner of it. You may notice hanging up there, there's a whole lot of lead, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. So, um, and I, I'm not very good but I do like playing around with things. And so I did this for a friend as a broken old chair and I did, turned it into that, which is quite nice because I like the caning. I don't know if anyone does caning in their sheds. Caning is a lovely thing, enormously therapeutic. I loved caning. You can just, just do it and then you get this really solid structure just out of this cane. So I love caning, that was a really good thing to do. Sorry? Yeah, it is quite mathematical. Yeah, you get these nice hexagons coming out or octagons coming out naturally from it. Yeah, I like doing that. because mathematician. So, um, and uh, people have talked about um, carrying stuff around for ages. I didn't show this. The other thing is that you know, I spent, I had some lovely floorboards that I got from somewhere. 30 years I carried these around from house to house and shed to shed. And then finally in COVID, I was so driven, you know, because there was nothing to do. I built shelves out of it. And um, it, was, it was very nice with, uh, with uh, threaded rods and separators, really simple structure to build lovely shelves out of it. So I finally used up this thing. So I carry stuff around for ages. Um, and the other thing I do is stained glass, um, which again, I, I taught myself essentially. I did do a weekend's course, taught myself. I don't know if anyone does that in their shed, but it's a really lovely, you do? Yeah, do, do, how do you find it? it just started, yeah. I really recommend it because it's not actually that difficult and yet you can produce something very nice. And it's, the outlay isn't great, you need the grinder and the, the cutter and things like that and a bit of glass, lead. Um, and actually though, you can produce, I think, some lovely stuff. I do mathematical, tend to do mathematical stained glass. So that, that see my hanging in my window, um, that's the smallest square you can make out of squares of different sizes. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> It's the small, and it's been proven that it is the smallest square of squares. They're all different sizes, and they make, make a square. And so on, mathematician is difficult, proved it's the only one, that it is the smallest one you can do it with. So it's actually asking for, to do it in glass, I think. And it's also sort of Mondrian, slightly look at it. And it's also a, a demonstration of the four color theorem. Do people know the four color theorem? Why does a map maker only need four colors? Because it's impossible to, to um, uh, the, 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 you, uh, whatever the shape of a map, countries of a map, you can only need four colors and in order to make sure that no countries have the same color next to each other. So I know I only need four colors to do that. Um, but I wanted to have, to make it as Mondrian looking as possible, I wanted to have the big things in the corners to be, to be transparent. And so, there's quite a limited number of ways I could rearrange the other three colors to do that so that no squares of the same color touched each other. Anyway, this is the sort of stuff I got. And then I put it out on the internet and suddenly all around the world, people were suggesting other ones and saying, oh, there's 43 different ways of doing that. And so, anyway, you, you shouldn't set people puzzles like that. Um, that's another one I did uh, recently uh, for a friend as a commission. And uh, this was the bottom of three panels and it ended up in their window like this as Norfolk Reads. Look, I put this all together, broke, broke the glass. Look at the crack, broke it, run out of that kind of glass. <laughs> Only had one big sheet of this stuff, that's all that was left. Nothing completely unavailable. So as you notice in there, 
there's a there's a sort of join in there with a, with a thing like that. I, don't, I only had small pieces left. That's the point. I did a bit, and so that was a bit of bodging. But it's art. Who cares? You know, <laughs> you're allowed. You're allowed to bodge. You're allowed to bodge when it's art. Yeah. Okay. I'm, actually, have I got sound on here? I just realised. Is there? I wonder if I can. Um, okay. So just to finish off, as a bit of light relief, I want to see if I can make this work. Um, do, do people recognise that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's the wipeout course in Argentina because one of the things I did as. Um, when I got this job as to, you know, I, as my daughter's encouragement, say, oh, God, Dad, why don't we apply to go and wipe out? You know, it's ridiculous. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. And, and I applied and, and we got on. So I got to Argentina, Buenos Aires. So, um, and, and, but I did the maths for this. <laughs> So these, so wipeout is this obstacle course and you fall in the water and jump off the big red balls and this sort of stuff. And um, I wanted to get through the qualifier, the top first 12 get through the qualifier and um, uh, out of 20, and the winner gets 50,000 quid, but I wasn't gonna get that. So and on Wikipedia, they had all the times of the 12th fastest. So I could look at the data and realize that the 12th fastest tend to be around three minutes so I only had to train for three minutes. So if I couldn't do it in three minutes, then I was, you know, I was lost anyway. So let me see if this works. Yes. Wow, this is incredible. The total wipeout course, it's, it's beautiful. Look down there. Is that 20 ordinary everyday Brits, including a railway engineer, a poker player, and a penguin keeper, I can see wavy? Now, this is Professor David Spiegelhalter, OBE, and he's a professor of risk. What this means is that if I'm going to qualify, I've just got to get below three minutes. Yeah, right. Below three minutes is the key, and off goes the professor towards the nasty snowballs. Yes? Yes? Uh oh! <laughs> He followed the Y axis when he should have followed the X. On to Granny's house now, a risky destination. All right, Professor Spiegel Hall. Oh! <laughs> yeah, he could still be doing this in under three minutes. All he has to do is clear both logs. Oh, the gentleman don't profess too much. Despite that risky performance, Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE climbs to the finish in three minutes, 17. Yeah. First 12 go through, remember. Now, taking the lead, it's suspicious Helen, followed by Saxy Fiona and Carolyn from Outer Space. In fourth, it's Bull Crossing No Meat Marina. In seventh, Rob Boy. And scraping it through to the next round are Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE, Ali the Penguin King and Guinea Pig Mel. Yeah, so I got through. So the next day, you come back to the next round. The 12 remaining competitors must mount the ski lift and do their utmost to remain standing. To help them, they have a podium to perch on and a bar. Finally, it's Professor David Spiegelhalter, OBE. What am I doing here? I don't stand a chance. It's nice. No, it was boiling hot. Ski problems have started. Oh, my God. Now they will need to jump over both arms, which get raised up as the game goes on. Remember, the last five still hanging will go through to the next round. Oh, Professor Spiegelhalter! I don't stand a chance! All making light work of their ski poles so far. And there's Professor Spiegelhalter OBE, Rob Boy. Those poles are getting higher now. There's John. Job again. And James. Ooh. Oh, let it go! No. There's Mel. Oh no, Mel! Oh, Mel! Hence now, the next two to fall will be as a competition. When we know, suspicious head. That's a Spiegelhalter OBE. Look, 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 they slow it down. They slow it down. Oh, oh no. no. Himself no. In <laughs> And didn't find it. <laughs> so Professor Spiegelhalter OBE is the next victim of this first ski lift. Yeah, anyway, so that just goes to show what you can get up to when you have a ridiculous job like I have. Anyway, so thank you very much indeed, and um, I'll try to answer some questions if anyone's got any.
about anything. Wipe out COVID statistics, <laughs> men. Yeah. Could you introduce us to your billionaire? Oh yes, yeah, that's what everyone asks. Oh no, 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 no. I keep him to my keep him to myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, running a, a group for thirty six years with no leader. Yeah. It's an interesting concept. How does that work? Well, some people do take it upon themselves because now we've, in, during COVID, we became a walking group, which we still are essentially. And so, and, and we've, we haven't got an absolute fixed time of meeting. So somebody does take it upon themselves to send around an email to arrange a time. But um, that's just, uh, they were just doing that because they feel like doing it in, in a sense. Um, but the crucial thing is there's no sort of ranking at all. There's no organization whatsoever. And we all have an equal part in the whole thing. How do you make decisions? About well, we're hopeless, absolutely hopeless. <laughs> I don't recommend it at all. It's absolutely <laughs> useless for actually doing anything. You know, that'll be, we, <laughs> how do you make decisions? <laughs> no, no, that's why we haven't changed. Partly, I mean, I think our longevity is partly because we don't, we haven't actually had any great big initiatives. We've just toddled along in, a, in just doing, just, you know, I think helping each other in a, in a gentle and uh, a gentle way. And we've all, you know, we've had endless discussions about how we should do more. We should be perhaps a bit more confrontational. Uh, we should do it. And we do some, we have do, done, you know, things. We've had projects. Um, we all did Desert Island Discs 15 years ago, which is where I had my list, which is a great project. You know, every week somebody would uh, meeting, someone else would turn up with their eight records on a, you know, what was then on a cassette tape, and talk about what it meant for them. It was a really good project. It was an excellent thing to do, to do your own Desert Island Discs as a group. Um, and then because then you can, you know, answer questions about it. But no, I, I think, um, you know, n not having a leader has got advantages and, and disadvantages. I mean, if you want to, progress and expand and then it's it's not appropriate at all yeah. How often do you meet? it was every two weeks for, for years and um, now it's been a bit less in free, more infrequent probably every three or four on the walking but I hope we can get back to more for when we start when meeting we've got a, we've got a couple of uh, people who are really there's five of us now essentially and one really quite cautious well his family's very cautious about him meeting indoors for things so um, still so we haven't got back to meeting indoors yet but when we walk you do the shoulder to shoulder which is good I like talking I like walking with people and men um, shoulder to shoulder talking is good but we'd still do stop and actually form a circle and do the exchange that we're used to yeah absolutely very good yeah those things have because when we started we all had young most of us had young kids and we and we were all kind of quite very active in childcare, and so there was quite a lot of discussion on how we felt about that and I don't know you know sexual problems with our partners and that kind of stuff which which all came out and we've had, also had you know, gay and bisexual members as well it's never been a problem that that's always just felt gone very easily um, but as we got older yeah no it's changed because you know you're more settled in your relationships and well, you don't have that sort of struggle um, but then the, the body start falling apart so um, Ah, we've had you know, two deaths, three cancers go, are currently going on at the moment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Shingles, the lot. So the, the you know, the, the, as we say, you know, you know, the organ recital at the beginning of the meeting where we go through our, our various c collapsing faculties, you know. And, uh, but the point is that I think we're quite sympathetic listeners, but also we can get a laugh out of it, you know, who really can, yeah. You've not been the same group from the beginning. Presumably you've had new members come in. And how have you seen, how have they integrated? Into yeah, that's quite interesting because we are in such a closed group. You know, people can't just turn up. Yeah. You know, you have to. So we've been really quite selective about people coming in. Um, so out of the five of us meeting at the moment, uh, four go back to that workshop. Um, and so two of the others workshop had died, one's moved away and one came in just soon after the workshop. So essentially we go back to the beginning, um, the five who meet up at the moment. But as I said, um, no, we've been highly selective of people who have to come in and kind of audition them and things like that because we want to stay a, a group and we don't... We, uh, we, we, we used to have open meetings 
Um, uh, because we were quite proselytizing as well early on, because we really felt that this was important. And so we used to have open meetings and invite people in, but it was not clear that this was not an invitation to join the group. I would encourage people to go away and join, the, form their own. Yeah. Is there an, an interconnected network? There, exactly, there used to be. There used to be a, a, a men's network. And I don't know what, I don't think it's there anymore. I think, I mean, this all seems a bit anachronistic now. I mean, I'm interested in what has happened. I, mean, I think this men's shed, that's why hearing about this, I was just, that was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Because you could see that the ethos behind it was so, is so similar. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a bit outdated now, the sort of our format of these things. I think, I think it's a shame. I think this could be very, still very valuable for men's um, well, mental health and just well-being, which is what this is all about. Um, it's friend, long-term friendship. But we, I mean, people were friends outside as well, to a certain extent, but on the whole, that's not, not the point. It's to do with um, a, a semi-structured organization in this thing. Um, no, I don't know if there are. I see there is a, another Cambridge, someone has formed a Cambridge men's group that's on, they do meet, um, that seems to have similar um, objectives, but it's an open, more open thing, run by, but it's run by somebody, I think, as a counselor, yeah. Um, but maybe people know better, but I, it doesn't seem to be a, a movement in the way it was. Yeah. I just want to thank you for uh, sharing um, your, your personal and private story with your son. Yeah. Um, I lost my son recently as well. Um, now, he was a child, he was six, six years of age, died oh. of a plenty of accident. Right. Mm -hmm. The reason for me joining Men's Shed was for mental health reasons, for distraction. Yeah. And I think it's an absolute amazing uh, place to go, especially if you're a man <coughs> who can't sometimes show their emotions as much. Yep. And um, it, it's helped me immensely just knowing the fact that I've got somewhere to go that I can release my own emotions uh, and, and be part of a group of men who have had all sorts of circumstances who have gone their lives. So I really uh, appreciate what you said. Yeah. I, 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 think, I, I think the bereavement thing is so important because men and bereavement tend not to get on very well at all. And it's not helped, of course, by, I don't know what the response has been from people you know, but you know, a common response, because it's so difficult, your situation, um, is that people will actually, because they don't know what to say, or they'll ignore it, they'll, they'll keep away from it. They won't, they won't broach the subject. Yeah, yeah, they're avoiding it, you know, crossing the road and this sort of thing, you know. And so, even if you, and which makes it even worse, I mean, it's difficult enough to express, you know, what, what you're feeling anyway, but let alone, but <laughs> then you haven't even got an audience, because <laughs> nobody wants to, wants to listen. So, um, I think that uh, we, in a way, I was doubly fortunate, uh, you know, given that something like this is going to happen, I was doubly fortunate, first of all, that I already had um, uh, th th this, men's uh, net, you know, a group of people who I knew I could talk about this and carry on talking about it for the next 35 years without them showing obvious signs of boredom. Because I tell you, you know, you meet talking for 30, 35 years, you do hear the same things over and over and over again. Oh God, you know, one of us is a bit of a hypochondriac. Oh Christ, what is it now? You know, you start making a joke about it because the same things come up. The same, same stuff again and again. These great, long, drawn out soap operas. Anyway, so, but they were, I knew that I was going to be able to do that. But the other, it's also things to say advantage is that um, death of my son was not a surprise. We had a long time to prepare for it and a long time to prepare our friends and community for it. So when it happened, they could all be involved, as we showed, there's huge numbers of people involved in the whole, the making the cakes and the doing everything like that, which meant also that in the subsequent years, it's been a topic that we can easily bring up. Other people bring it up and talk, oh, I remember Dan's funeral and things like that. So it's not that awful, I mean, it's bad enough to be bereaved, but to then not be able to, to, to you know, reflect on it and talk about it afterwards is just awful. My son died during the COVID period. Oh, no. And so it was difficult just for that reason itself. Uh, but still, we had a, a basket that people still turned up to the funeral. All right, okay. Outside of the chapel. Yeah. But um, it, it's, it's amazing that, uh, you know, in isolation, how much, you know, it can, it can help um, when you've got something like Men's Shed eventually. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and for going on and on and on, because so it doesn't go away. <laughs> um, the, way was, uh, the description I, I learned from somebody when I was on the helpline is that, you know, the, the waves get further apart, but they never stop coming. Insightful, and David, you're going to stay around. Oh, yeah, all day. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. if there's any questions or you want to yeah. talk to him about anything, you can really happy, about, really happy to do it. Yeah. Please feel free to do so. And so, we have this um, commission um, from Chris <gasps> no. downstairs as a gift for you from Men's Sheds. <gasps> um, it is uh, specially treated on the outside, so it's rusting, which you need to ask him because it's. I'm getting some of Chris's work. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, that's, that's just the most wonderful thing ever. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.